Okay, let's get started. Uh, there may be a few more joining as we move along. This is Michael Payne. I wanna welcome you to the third in our series of webinars on the general subject of avoiding common mistakes in federal construction contracting. But in this part three, we're gonna specifically address common mistakes during the REA claims and appeals process. And you know, when we use the term mistakes, we don't really mean to say it in an accusatory way. Uh, these are things that just happen. You know, as lawyers, we almost never get a call from a client telling us that things were just great. They had no problems and, and the contract turned out even better than they thought. We hope that that happens, but those aren't the calls that we get. The calls we get is when there's been some sort of a disaster or a problem. And sometimes, it's a result of a mistake, meaning that that problem could have been avoided. Uh, not always a mistake by the contractor because let's face it, the government often is the cause of the problems that contractors encounter. And uh, someone once said to me, well, why are you teaching contractors how to avoid mistakes? Isn't that going to cost you business? Uh, I don't think so because we can pretty well rely on the government to generate problems that'll give contractors no choice but to ask for more money and time and things like that. So we're going to talk about some of those things today. Uh, just by way of uh, logistics, uh, all the participants are muted. If you have questions, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box. And the presentation is being recorded so that everyone will be able to receive a copy of that. Um, as I said, I'm Michael Payne. I'm chair of our government contracting group. Uh, once upon a time, I was a division trial attorney for the Army Corps of Engineers North Atlantic Division, so I can give you somewhat of a perspective from the government and contractors. Uh, Casey McKinnon is the partner in, who runs the government contracting matters in our Washington, D.C. office, and he's heavily involved in many cases with me, as is Steve Tobin, who is a senior counsel, and Steve uh, has the benefit of having worked for many years with the headquarters of the Navy in Washington, DC and their office of counsel. Uh, Dave Patrone was the regional counsel for the uh, 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 Northeast region of NAFAC for many years. And he certainly can give us a lot of insights on the government side of things. And Ryan Boonstra is my right-hand man here in the Philadelphia office who works very closely with me on many, many cases. Uh, and gets involved in many cases from the, the ground floor up. So with that as sort of a background, what when we talk about REAs, requests for equitable adjustment, uh, claims, and uh, appeals, it all originates with a dispute. There's been some sort of a disagreement with the government, maybe an argument, and certainly issues that are debated. Uh, sometimes those issues involve matters of contract interpretation. Uh, it, may, it may require legal advice to see which contract interpretation is the correct one. Uh, you may know there's an order of precedence in government contracts where the general provisions govern everything, but then the written specifications come next, and then the specification, the drawings come after that. So that if there's a dispute between, for example, what's in a written specification versus what's shown on a drawing, the order of precedence clause says that the written specification prevails. That's assuming that it clearly addresses the issue. But one thing is certain, you can't have the government insert in the specification, shape, specification something that contradicts a general provision of the contract, like the differing site conditions clause. And uh, we've seen cases where the government puts exculpatory language in a solicitation and says, despite what we're representing, don't rely on these representations about subsurface conditions. Well, that contradicts the differing site conditions clause, which allows you and encourages you to rely on those representations. So sometimes uh, those are issues we have to address. And then, of course, there can be disputes about, well, what actually is the scope of the work? The government will claim that some extra, what seems to you to be extra work uh, is within the scope of the contract and you should have planned on doing it. And you will point to the specs or the drawing and say, no, it's not shown here. As a matter of fact, quite the contrary. So a dispute arises. 
all over the meaning of the contract, what's required of the contractor, what what's the proper interpretation of the plans and specifications and 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 of course the various clauses in the contract come into play in originating a dispute whether it's the changes clause or differing site conditions clause suspension of work terminations delay whatever it might be those are the things that lead to disputes between contractors and the government and of course as i said in one of our earlier presentations uh, protecting your rights is really paramount. Uh, you have to be prepared from the earliest time when a dispute arises, and we'll talk more about this later, to document your position, to be able to explain your position, and to recognize those things that you have to do to protect your rights uh, down the road. Uh, it may mean that you have to send letters or emails or have meetings, whatever, keep, keep good details in your records, whatever the case might be. But you don't wanna be in a position where later you haven't done everything to protect your rights uh, going forward. Uh, remember that uh, claims and disputes uh, have an accrual, are, are measured from the time that they accrued. And what that means is, when did you first become aware of the events that would lead possibly to a claim? because you have six years from that time uh, under the Contract Disputes Act to file a claim. So it's not from the beginning of the contract necessarily. It's not from the last day of performance of the contract. It's when the claim accrued. So if the claim is one that arises under the differing site conditions clause, start measuring from the day you realized and notified the government that you had a differing site condition. Um, and another subject that bears repeating here is understanding the agency hierarchy as you proceed with these things, uh, with, with REAs, claims, or appeals. And uh, Steve Tobin, because of his many years on the government side, is well aware of this. Steve, why don't you comment uh, about this? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michael. So this is really kind of the nuts and bolts of understanding various roles and responsibilities with your with your partners in the government. And it really sets the landscape um, in terms of how issues that look like they might be percolating into a REA or a claim, uh, full-blown, you know, dispute, you know, it, it frames um, it frames that that kind of that 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 boundary. And and so let's talk a little bit about um, some of those key points, right? So the contracting officer, they're the ones, they typically have what they call a warrant. They're, they're the ones authorized to bind the government. So they're going to be the key decision makers at the end of the day. But you can't overlook the team that they've put together on your contracts, right? So you're going to have some of the technical folks. You're going to have your engineers. You're going to have other people involved in these projects that the contracting officer typically relies on to fill in the details whenever a dispute starts to bubble up. The contracting officers, as a matter of routine, might not have a command of all the details about a particular issue. So they're going to rely on their team. Um, and, and that goes to the point of, look, you want to manage your relationships with your counterparts on the government side of the table. All right. So, um, you know, you want to you want to be in good stead with them. You want to um, try to keep everything, um, you know, professional. You don't want to dig in and create an adversarial posture. Uh, you recognize that somebody on the government side who might have the loudest voice in the room is not the person you need to convince. Sometimes the government or the contracting officer has one or two key people that they are going to use as their confidants to really get a feel for what the issue is and what the best path forward is to resolve it. So again, you want to know who those people are. You want to know what their responsibilities are. And uh, you know the, the third bullet point I think is really important when it comes to, in particular, the DOD. Respect the chain of command. Know who you need to talk to and follow it, um, follow that chain and don't try to jump it because typically what will happen is the person you go to who is not supposed to be the one you're talking to is just gonna redirect you. So respect that chain of command and, and know the people um, you need to be talking to. So we go to the next slide. Yeah. All right. And so this is kind of, you know, hand in glove with that previous slide, right? So when disputes start to arise, 
it should be your goal, and frankly, it's the government's goal, to try to resolve them at the lowest level possible. All right. And that first bullet point, right, just dovetails right to, to what we were just talking about, the chain of command. Know who you got to talk to, know who your decision makers are. Um, ask for meetings. This is really important as well. Look, you want to sit down face to face with your with the government's team and, and discuss these issues and really hash out your side and understand what their side is. It's very difficult to do. Um, over email for sure. You don't want to get bogged down, I think, at this point in the early in when a dispute might be arising in a letter campaign where everyone's just exchanging documents back and forth. I think sitting down face to face, you know, it, it makes it easier to have a more robust and, and candid discussion with that government team so that everybody's kind of level set as to what their positions are. And when you have those meetings, be prepared for them. Know the details of what the issue is that you want to present to them. Um, the government's going to ask you for those details, and you don't want to go in and, and have to regurgitate, well, we have to look into that. We're not sure about that. Assume the government is going to be uh, prepared with their side of the dispute or their side of the issue. They're going to know the details. You want to offer uh, additional information. Um, to help fill in any gaps that the government might have during those discussions. And again, as we talked earlier, you don't want to be combat combative. It's, it's not, you don't want to be adversarial at this point in time. This is, you know, a point on the schedule where people can really come with, come up with creative solutions and get over some of the humps that might be impeding um, a, a resolution to, to the issue. Um, it, one thing I would say, and this goes to that second to last bullet point about being creative and coming up with creative solutions. A lot of the government is, is kind of set in their ways and they don't always uh, think outside of the box. So if you have an opportunity, whether it's in person or telephonically or over email, when you come in to have those discussions, be prepared with a creative solution. Sometimes it's just not immediately obvious to the government a way around something. And so Think, uh, think about these issues ahead of time, come in, be prepared to discuss them and throw them something they might not have been thinking about. I think that will really help move some of these issues forward before they really um, you know, evolve into something more adversarial, which is, which is something we probably want to avoid. Uh, and, and, and to the last point, look, it benefits everybody, both the government and the contractor to resolve these things early and as informally as possible. The more people retreat into their various foxholes to, to fight about some of these issues, the more time and money is gonna be expended. So you seize the opportunity, get in front of your, your counterparts at the government and try to work these things out early and often. Thanks, Steve. What this leads to, of course, is what happens if you can't do as Steve suggests, resolve things at the lowest possible level. Uh, the people in the field are intransigent. Uh, the, your position doesn't allow for much, much flexibility for some reason or another. And the only way you're going to get compensation is to formally ask for either additional money or additional time. One question that we get all the time is, well, should we just file an REA? Or should we file a claim? And, and what's the difference? Well, an, a request for an equitable adjustment is something that you always have the right to request of the government under any one of a number of clauses, most notably the changes clause, a differing site condition clause, and the suspension of work clause. You can ask for it. You can ask for it informally. You can do it verbally uh, at the site. You can send an email or a letter or you can actually put something together that's titled Request for Equitable Adjustment. And that needs to be set up pretty much the same way that a claim would be set up. In other words, it should explain the background of the issue or issues. There should be a statement of, of facts. I usually recommend doing it chronologically. Uh, this uh, project was solicited on this date. There were a number of bids or offers. Uh, contract was awarded to our company on such and such a date. We received the notice to proceed on this date. We began working by doing this and that. 
and then we ran into this problem. And that's when you discuss the particular factual issue that's involved, but go through an explanation of those facts and attach exhibits where necessary, because don't assume that the reader of this REA is going to have any familiarity with the project whatsoever. Uh, that person may not, and may be looking at this for the first time. Make it easy for them. Don't expect them to go dig out what you believe is a key email or a key letter. Attach it so that they can leaf right back to it and see what the support is for what you're saying. But it's something that's followed by some sort of a legal or technical analysis as well, much like a claim. In other words, you lay out the facts and you say, now, based on these facts, I'm entitled to more money or more time for the following technical reasons, explaining why uh, the government's position is not in compliance with the specs and yours is, or as a matter of law, and you might need some help from an attorney to be able to write this part. Uh, there are cases that have held when the, this factual situation is encountered, it gives us a right to additional compensation. The answer to the question about whether to file an REA or a claim, though, depends on how you think things are going to go once you submit it. If you have a very good working relationship with the agency at the time, and you think that they're somewhat, even though they haven't granted you entitlement yet, even though you think they're somewhat sympathetic, and maybe with a little bit more coaxing, they might come around to seeing your point of view, we would usually tell people, let's try an REA. It's less formal, it still lays out the story, but it's less formal and maybe the government will sit down and meet with you and try to resolve it because they'll realize once you've laid it all out that you're right. The danger is that the clock's not ticking. The government can sit on an REA indefinitely. They're not required to issue a formal decision of any kind. Sometimes they'll issue a letter telling you why they disagree. I've seen cases where two years have gone by and the government doesn't even pay any attention to it. Well, that's two years that you've wasted because uh, there, there's no benefit to you whatsoever. So what you have to do is decide, is it likely that the government will take this seriously and look at it early? And if you're not sure, but you wanna play nice, submit an REA and then give it two or three months. And if after a reasonable time, they're not getting back to you, then I would get in touch with the government and say, have you looked at the REA? Can we talk about it? What do you wanna do? As soon as you get the feeling that they're stalling or not taking it seriously, that's the time to pull the plug on the REA process and to convert it to a claim. Now you will have done most of the work in putting the claim together by submitting the REA. I assume the statement of facts isn't gonna change, the legal and technical analysis, may not change. Maybe you'll come up with additional information that you can add, but it should be fairly easy to convert it to a claim. The Contract Disputes Act says that if a claim is under $100,000, it does not need to be certified. If it's $100,000 or more, then you need to attach the FAR certification in order for it to be an effective claim. But the important part is once the claim is submitted, the clock starts ticking. The government can no longer sit back and ignore it. They have 60 days to issue a contracting officer's final decision. And if they fail to tell you within 60 days in a claim over $100,000, when that decision will be issued, and it's not a reasonable time, you can more for, move forward and appeal their failure to issue a decision by what's known as a deemed denial appeal. The point I'm making is, the clock is ticking. There's some pressure on the government to do something now. And most importantly, interest is starting to run. From the date you submit the claim, the interest clock starts ticking. It's interest under the treasury rate. It's over the last few years been a very low rate, starting to go up now, unfortunately. So interest is not uh, something that, that you should ignore. And in both of these things, whether it's an REA or a claim, you have two areas of discussion. One is entitlement and one is called quantum. Quantum, these are terms of art that the government using, uses. Entitlement means, is there merit in my claim? Have I demonstrated that I am entitled to compensation under one of these clauses because my version of the facts is correct? 
Then you turn to quantum. Okay, I've established that there was a change. I've established that there was a differing site condition. How much money or time can I prove resulted from that? And over the years, we've noticed a lot of contractors that spend all their time working on entitlement and not enough time on quantum. It's a real tragedy. If you put together a lengthy, well-documented claim to find out that although you're asking for $250,000, you can only really approve 100,000. Uh, that might have affected your decision about how far you wanted to go with this in the first place. Uh, so consider both entitlement and quantum uh, before proceeding. Now, when you put the presentation together, there are certain, there's, there's no guidebook, there's no formula, there are many different ways to do it. Um, whether it's an REA or a claim, Steve, why don't you talk about uh, some of the things that need to be kept in mind? Yeah, sure. So as Michael was just saying, uh, from a, a format perspective, there's there's various options you can do, but there's the core things you want to do, right, is you want to make sure that you've got your facts. You want to make sure you're talking about why, from a technical standpoint, you're entitled to some type of relief, whether it's monetary or an extension of the contract completion date. I think one of the things that gets left out of all of this is you want to write persuasively. You, you want to make sure that what you're putting forward, because you're trying to make an impression, and, and this happens whether you're doing your, your proposals or some other type of correspondence throughout administration of the contract, but you want to put your best foot forward and demonstrate that you have a real command of the facts, a real command of the entitlement basis, so that it makes the government think, listen, they've got their ducks in a row, and they have convinced us that there's merit to the issue they've now presented to us. So again, you want to tell your story and you do it, I think, chronologically. I think that's the easiest way to express all the events that kind of built to this crescendo of now here's this dispute or here's this situation for which we think we need to get uh, some form of relief. Um, Michael talked about it earlier and I'll kind of stomp my foot on this one again is, look, if there's important documents or other pieces of information that have occurred that's going to support your position. Don't make the government go looking for it, attach it, refer to it. Um, and again, legal argument is you wanna, you, you know, you again, you wanna show that there's a basis for relief and what that basis is. And you would, you know, consider your audience someone who again, doesn't have a full command of the situation, at least all the details. Um, and and this, this comment here about purple prose is, look, you don't need to, to write war and peace. You don't need to write something that's going to get you the most creative, you know, writer award of the center, whatever it is. Stick to the nuts and bolts of it again, your facts and your entitlement, and make sure you express what the damage is. Because, right, there's, there's three things here. There's liability, meaning the government's responsible for something that's happened. There's causation, that whatever they did caused some type of injury. And that injury is expressed in the form of, of damages. So you want to make sure you kind of hit those three points, regardless of whether or not you're using an REA or you've submitted a certified claim. Thanks, Steve. Casey, I know you've been involved in a lot of claims and REAs lately, too. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I could add in kind of the two most common mistakes I see, particularly when a client themselves has prepared an REA or claim. The first one I kind of refer to as the Goldilocks problem. It's either way too short or way too long. So we do see claims that go in that simply state, as you're aware, we've encountered uh, unexpected groundwater. Please provide us with a modification for $1.5 million. They don't add in all the pieces here, the facts, what the specs provided, and then the legal claims. And on the other end, we see clients put together claims that are 70 pages of narrative. And truth be told, Steve alluded to this earlier, you need to make this easy for people. No one wants to read through war and peace about what happened here. So you don't want to put too few facts in and you know leave out that analysis, but it's also important to keep it tailored to the issue at hand. Don't start grabbing complaints about personnel and all kinds of other issues that have come up during a project. You want to make it straightforward, simple. If you can include specific quotes from the specs or a drawing that you think is important, attach it or even paste it right into your narrative so that it's as easy as possible for someone to get through. 
Those are, in my eyes, the most common mistakes we see that prevent someone from recovering early on when maybe they have a great case and they could have come to an agreement, but just because they haven't laid it out in a easy to consume persuasive fashion, they end up in litigation that they could have otherwise avoided. That's right. And, and you know, uh, let me just embellish on the purple prose point. You know, don't use colorful adjectives when talking about the government people. Don't refer to that outrageously incompetent inspector and, and then follow it with his name in the claim. Uh, those types of adjectives aren't, even though it may be true, aren't going to score any points. And I've always found that the government doesn't particularly like it if their people are named in a claim. In other words, refer to them by their title, the contracting officer, the inspector, the resident engineer. Uh, the name may become important later if you get into litigation, but at this point, just, just stick to the facts. Okay. Um, now, in keeping with what uh, Steve and Casey were just talking about, Casey, uh, documentation follows very closely. And uh, why don't you talk about that? Sure. In any claim, REA, appeal, any kind of litigation to get into, documents are really the key to succeeding. And the reason for that is if all you're relying upon when you're requesting some sort of equitable adjustment or relief is a he said, she said situation, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to persuade someone or prevail at trial. So much of the work to be done if you're going to succeed in these disputes is done during the events that give rise to the dispute, documenting, as we start here in the bullet points, contemporaneously and through daily reports, hopefully. So the best cases that we see teed up for litigation or appeals are those where the issue is documented immediately in a notice letter to the government each preceding day. There's references in daily reports or other notes to explain how many additional personnel were put toward this particular issue and what was happening, all the specifics you can have there, because at that point, you're no longer relying upon someone's rough recollection of what happened. You can document that at the time, day by day, this is exactly what was happening. So those sorts of documents can really, I understand that they're difficult to keep up on a daily basis, but they can be paramount when it comes to succeeding. Uh, photographs and video recordings. Sometimes pictures speak louder than words. So rather than a handwritten description of the differing site condition you encountered, a picture of it can be very helpful because it helps the, might be the reader who's not on the project and not aware of the facts, or it might be a judge down the road to understand what exactly we're talking about here and just wrap their head around the issue. Uh, the biggest issue that we see <laughs> in terms of, we'll say, problematic documentation, other than not creating it in the first place, is problematic email. And I think people frequently forget that every email you send on a project is discoverable. And when you get into litigation, the parties are gonna request those emails from each other. So be careful about what you write down. Uh, that can be a angry email someone fires off that ends up hurting their case down the road. It can be an internal email where someone, whether they're right or wrong, might admit that they've made a mistake or that problems have arisen. And down the road, there's no way to explain that email away. So when you're writing emails on a project, particularly when you've gotten into the disputes process or something has become adversarial, think about your emails as something that eventually the other party may have access to and write them accordingly. <laughs> um, and as we said here, just to reiterate, the best way to avoid a trial is to prepare for trial. And the best way to prepare for trial is to keep those documents all along the way. And I want to turn to Ryan for a second uh, to, to speak about the new world of electronically stored information, because Ryan really runs point on a lot of these issues for us. And I think from the client perspective, there's often mistakes or misunderstandings about how much information is involved when you get into litigation and all the trouble and work that comes along with it. Uh, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, absolutely, Casey. So as the bullet point says, we are in a new world of electronically stored information or ESI. And what that means is everything is handled digitally now. You know, the, you don't go to the government's offices and parse through their records anymore, and they don't come to your offices to go through your records. The expectation is that the parties will exchange digital information during discovery, and that may be hundreds of thousands of documents, depending on the size of the case. So the most important thing that a contractor can do is begin at the very start of any project, even during the solicitation phase, organize your emails, organize your documents and messages by 
project or by specific contract. So if there isn't a, a claim that arises during performance or post-performance, you can simply access that folder through your IT department or through your internal server and know that every important document related to this project is located in one place. It's very difficult to go back through your old emails and locate relevant messages that were exchanged between uh, your project team or with the government that may have a direct impact on the case. You know, there's a six year statute of limitations on contracts disputes act. So you may be looking back over a decade through some of your emails to try and find one key message that could play an important role. So it's always important to organize early and maintain that organization throughout the life of a project. Uh, once you get into litigation, then those that project file will be passed on to the attorneys that you're working with, and it'll be easier to sort through it using search terms and produce that information. We talked about the beware of email. The other aspect to ESI is metadata, and metadata is also discoverable. Uh, all project files, emails, and documentation gets produced natively. So the emails will be produced as if it were sent by you as if you were looking at it in your outlook application they can see who it was sent to when it was sent who drafted it who read it who opened it when it was open all of this information can be discovered through metadata and it has come up in the past where a contractor says well we know that they received it well how do you know well we have the metadata we have a read receipt that we can show showing that it was received it, Little things like that can become very important later on without even realizing. So it's important to document and retain everything you can when you're dealing with ESI. And I think you touched on an important aspect of this, Ryan, just now is maintain, collect, protect. So if you run into a situation where you know that there's a dispute coming, it's, it's a big one, it's likely to go to litigation, reach out to the people working on that team, working on the project internally, and make sure that they start segmenting their documents out. Nothing gets deleted, keep everything ready and make sure none of it gets lost in your system. There's no automatic deletion of emails after a, current, or a certain period of time because it can lead to real problems and really impact your ability to recover if you end up at trial. So it's not just producing those documents but also making sure that you keep all of the relevant documents when you see an issue coming. Okay, well, thanks, Casey and Ryan. Ryan, we certainly can tell that you've been through the wars on this, and I know <laughs> that you have. Uh, it, it really has become a very big part of litigation process, uh, going through the documentation and finding out in all of these sometimes hundreds of gigabytes of information, what it is that's relevant and what is not. A very time-consuming and potentially very expensive process. Uh, just add one comment on photographs and video recordings. You know, it's been said that a photograph is worth a thousand words and that a video is worth a thousand photographs. Well, make sure that these things are uh, authenticated. You want to be able to show who took the photograph, when it was taken, and what that person was intending to show. The same thing with video. You know, video recorded, recorders have a sound capability don't have some running narrative that's uh, speaking disparagingly of the government people <laughs> while you're making this recording. Uh, that could be potentially embarrassing. I'll never forget the time in a different site conditions case, and this is when I was with the government, that the contractor submitted a photograph of what he said was a boulder. Well, there was no frame of reference, and it wasn't like there was a person standing next to it or a truck next to it where you could see that it really was a boulder. It just was. Uh, a full frame of what he said was a boulder. Well, for reasons I won't bore you with, we were later able to establish that it was a close-up of a pebble. So uh, you don't want to do things like that. You want to have a way of authenticating uh, what it is that you're that you're displaying. Okay. Uh, as part and parcel of this process of putting together an REA or a claim. At some point in the process, you'll need to engage an expert in many different types of cases. It, it, we've had cases where concrete was an issue and we've had to get a concrete expert. We certainly have had delay issues where we need a delay expert. Uh, we've had differing site conditions where we need a geotechnical expert. Um, you, and I mentioned this in one of our earlier 
uh, webinars as well. Get the person involved as early as you want because as you can, as long as when you recognize there's an issue, because hopefully you want that person, if they have to testify later, to be able to say, yes, I went to the project and I saw this. I know what the contractor is talking about. Too many times the experts come off as hired guns where they say, oh yeah, I, I was hired three months ago after discovery was closed and I looked at documents and talked to people. Well, here's my opinion. Well, I'll always try to cross-examine that type of an expert by asking him, are you trying to tell the judge what the judge's opinion should be? Uh, <laughs> because that's what they're often trying to do. And judges resent that. They figure they're the decider of facts and law. And so th they might want an expert's opinion about what he observed or what his technical analysis was, but they're not so much interested in whether or not the expert thinks it's a differing site condition or not. That's a conclusion that they're not gonna defer to the expert on. So stay away from hired guns, try to get them to visit the project, and above all, make sure that they have the right qualifications and that they are articulate. Uh, you know, many experts are really very good in their field, but they can't write. I can't tell you how often we have to go through an expert's report that we're going to disclose to the other side and just correct the wording, you know, make it more readable. We certainly don't tell the uh, expert what to say, but we might tell them how to best say it uh, and, and, and make sure that this expert is the kind of a person who can get on the stand and speak in an articulate and persuasive way. He's got to be able to explain this to the judge, and he's got to be able to handle himself or herself well on cross-examination. And if this person gets overly nervous or starts to babble, uh, you might want to know that. You, you want someone, uh, the best experts are ones who come off in a professorial uh, sort of way, where they are educating the judge and explaining things in a way that's clearly understandable. And that, that usually will have the best impact uh, on the case going forward. Okay, Casey, we all know that, as I said, entitlements, the point that a lot of contractors spend their time on, the quantum and costs is really equally important. Uh, why don't you comment on that? Yeah, we alluded to this when we were talking about REAs and claims and in the claim context, particularly, we talked about a some certain, and like Michael just alluded to, People often spend all their time fighting about whether they're owed something, but then the question becomes, what is that something? And they don't have a clear answer. So it's important to collect, develop, and clarify your costs and how you're going to prove them if you're in a dispute with the government. Because we've run into a lot of situations where people are very vehemently sure of it, that they're owed money, but they can't really articulate exactly how they came up with a number, and that ends up preventing them from being able to recover. So First bullet is maintain proper cost records. This is probably the most important issue here. And the general advice is if you run into an issue, a change, a differing site condition, whatever the issue might be, it's important to start segmenting out or separating the costs that you're gonna to attribute to that issue from your other costs to the extent you can. Uh, often we run into trouble because someone has pooled all of their costs together your in-scope work and your out-of-scope work have merged together, bled together in your costs, and it's very difficult to extract the two and figure out which goes in column A and which in column B. And we do run into problems where the government will say, to some degree, I, I acknowledge that there's some entitlement. Something happened here that increased your costs, but you can't establish what those costs are, and I can't pay you an unknown amount of money, or as it turns out, an unknown amount of time. So segment the costs out, create different cost accounting systems, a different line item or job order that you're billing to, whatever it might be. Subcontractor payments, same thing. Make sure you separate those out so that at the end of the day, if you can convince someone that something has occurred that you're entitled to additional time or money for, you can articulate what amount of time or money you're looking for. And finally, beware of false claims. In the private sector, there's the idea of inflating and negotiate. I know someone's going to knock down my costs as soon as I submit them, bargain me down. So I think I'll just add in some fluff. Well, in the government world, that's known as a false claim, and it can get you into a world of trouble. So actual costs do not inflate them when it comes to claims and REAs. Okay, thanks, Casey. And of course, uh, when you're dealing with claims, you have to be careful that you haven't already waived your right to a claim. 
<laughs> and uh, we look at one of the first things we look at are modifications. Uh, Casey, why don't you talk about what is affectionately called a closing statement, but in the law is known as a release. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is the first question we'll ask most people come to us on claims is, were there any bilateral modifications and did they include release language or a closing statement? Because this is overlooked during the course of almost every project. Issues come up, bilateral modifications are signed, and there's this pesky language at the end of each one that states that this is a full and final release for all amounts, known or unknown, that are in any way related to this issue, time and money, anything across the board is now waived. So be very careful when you see bilateral mods on a federal project, watch out for the release language if it's there and the government won't remove it, but you do think you have additional issues that are gonna come up. But incorporate some carve out here, some uh, reservation of rights to state that we're resolving part of the issue here, but I reserve my rights to bring A, B, and C up in the future. You know, an easy example we run into often is there'll be a series of changes during a project and you'll have bilateral mods to address the narrow scope of the work required to address that issue. So we took out the unforeseen material that took us five days. Well, this came up 40 times during a project and each time we signed a bilateral mod, but at the end of the day, you also have cumulative impacts of all these stoppages and changes. So there's additional costs you wanna recover. Those releases can prevent you from doing so because if read narrowly, they say that you've released everything. So in general, if you see the release language, the closing statement, be very careful. It is the probably most common impediment we see for otherwise meritorious claims to be defeated. It's the first move government council makes as well. So keep a close eye out on those. Okay, thanks, Casey. Now, another thing that comes up when we're submitting particularly claims and certified claims under the Contract Disputes Act, there'll be a subcontractor involved. Um, some prime contractors will just submit a claim and not really get much input from the sub. Other times, it's really a subcontractor claim in the first place. And maybe the prime contractor only has his own markups to gain if this uh, claim is allowed. But the subcontractor needs the prime contractor in order to submit a claim to the government because under the law, subcontractors do not have privity of contract with the government, which means they do not have a government contract with the agency. Only the prime has that. And therefore the disputes clause that's in the prime contract applies to the prime and to the government. So uh, once a, whether you're a subcontractor who wants to promote your own claim or whether you're a prime contractor who wants to consider a subcontractor claim, one of the questions is, well, should this subcontractor claim be presented as a separate standalone document, which the prime will sponsor, or should it become just a subsection of the prime's claim? You know, a prime can have a claim for changes and another one for differing site conditions, another one for variation in estimated quantities, and another one for subcontractor costs which the subcontractor would put together and put together that part of the claim. And it can go into what would be called a package claim. Uh, it really depends on the nature of the claim, the size of the claim, how many different issues there are as to whether to make it separate or a package deal. Uh, in either case, however, the prime certainly has to practice due diligence because the last thing in the world a prime contractor wants to do is to sponsor by submitting on the sub's behalf a claim that turns out to be false. Uh, then the prime could be accused of a false claim as well as the subcontractor. So we always tell our primes, even though technically the subcontractor doesn't have to certify this claim, have the subcontractor certify it to you as the prime. Because from a prime contractor's point of view, if there's fraud, you want to be the victim of it, not a participant in it. So do your due diligence and get a certification. Um, the uh, Once you're satisfied that, wait, this is a meritorious claim by the subcontractor, and, and we're willing to sponsor it. And by sponsor it, I mean submit it to the government, either using your name on behalf of the subcontractor or as part of your package claim. Once you agree to do that, 
then it's going to go on to the point where it's either going to be negotiated or there's going to be a contracting officer's final decision or in a worst case scenario, this is going to be litigated. And then the contractor and the sub, the prime and the sub are going to be working on it together. What comes up uh, in some cases, however, is that uh, you uh, have a situation where the pro where the sub takes the point of view, well, I really am not sure whether the government owes me this money or whether you do the prime. Uh, the prime uh, is is uh, uh, not wanting to be in a position where if the case is lost against the government, uh, the, he's going to end up getting sued by the subcontractor. And th th that doesn't make for good friends. So many times there will be a liquidating agreement prepared. And what a liquidating agreement says is that the subcontractor, in exchange for cooperation and sponsorship by the prime, agrees that the uh, whatever is received from the government will be enough and will be satisfactory and will, uh, will end the matter. And he will waive his right to come after the prime contractor secondly. Uh, most of the time we found that subcontractors are willing to do that because let's face it, the deepest pocket is the government's pocket. Uh, as far as the Severn Doctrine is concerned, uh, Casey or Steve, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I can chime in. The, the issue you run into here is Michael just alluded to liquidating agreements. The one thing to make sure you don't do in that process is execute a release that says the prime contractor is not going to owe the subcontractor money under any circumstances. And it seems like an easy mistake to make because that's really what you're agreeing to. But the important part is to say that the prime doesn't owe the sub any money except that which the government pays to the prime, which will get handed down. And the reason for that is if the prime contractor brings a claim on behalf of the sub, but there's an agreement that says, I don't owe you any money no matter what, the government can defeat that claim by saying, I have a contract with the prime and you can't prove you have any liability. The sub has waived all claims against you. So there's no reason for me to pay you any money. So they have to be worded carefully to avoid uh, effectively waiving everyone's claim at the same time. It, it's gotta be narrowly construed, narrowly drafted. That's good advice because we've seen situations where primes have tried to recover uh, an amount of money from the government and they only owe the subcontractor substantially less or nothing at all, hoping that they can pocket the difference. Mm -hmm. The government finds out they call that fraud. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, it can be well-intentioned. It's not always intentional fraud, but if you're not careful, it can turn into that. You don't want to do it. Okay. And of course, we talked about certification, and whether it's an REA or whether it's a Contract Disputes Act claim there's a certification requirement. The government looks at it very closely. Steve, why don't you address that? Yes. Steve, you froze. I'm, sure, right. he's, I'm sure it's very helpful uh, analysis he's giving. <laughs> I'll pick up and hopefully Steve will, uh, will get back to us. Uh, proper certification is important for jurisdiction. It, 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 there you go. You're back, Steve. You froze oh, for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm having a, some internet problems here. Am, am I good? Yeah. Just yes. start. I, we just started with the first bullet point as to why it's important. Okay. Yeah. So it's important for jurisdictional purposes. So under the Contracts Disputes Act, you have to submit a certified claim. And there's two different certifications laid out right here, right? So you have a certification under the DFARS which is the DOD's you know, supplement to the, to the FAR, uh, for certifications that are um, for REAs that you're submitting to the government, you have to make a certain representation of certification. And the language is right there on the page, you can see it. Now, when you have a, a certified claim, the language is a little bit different. It's there at FAR Part 33207, and you have to have that in your claim. And, and the point of doing so is it kind of dovetails back to what Casey and Michael were just saying about fraud, fraudulent claims. The government wants assurances. Once again, we have a freeze. <laughs> they want assurances. I can probably finish a sentence here that these are actual costs incurred because of the issue, and not just a negotiating position. That's right. That's right. 
And, and if you don't have the certification attached, uh, well, the, what the decisions have said is that even if the contracting officer issues a contracting officer's final decision without the certification, a board or a court does not have jurisdiction to consider it. So if this is discovered a year or two down the line, the case could be thrown out at that point in time for lack of jurisdiction. So you want to make sure that you never, ever make that mistake of omitting the certification, whether it's an REA in the Department of Defense with a Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement certification, that's the one we printed there, or the CDA certification. And you should use the exact language as it's included in the regulations. Don't, don't decide to change the wording. Uh, the government's going to expect the same wording. Do you have anything to add to that, Steve? No, I think you hit the point. I, I'm, I'm having issues with <laughs> my connection, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm hearing everything. So it sounds like okay. you can. That's fine. We heard most of it. All right. As far as a, a contracting officer's final decision is concerned, uh, th that's something that I, that I mentioned before. Um, it's only required in response to a claim. An REA does not require it. <laughs> we call it a contracting officer's decision, but I think the, the acronym stands for contracting officer's denial. Uh, usually when a contracting officer issues a decision, it's denying your claim. If they're going to allow it, they'll invite you to negotiate. Now, sometimes a decision will be issued where they will grant partial merit. And, and uh, in, in that case, uh, uh, you can then go ahead and appeal that part that was denied. But more times than not, it's a total denial. Um, the decision has to be issued within 60 days. Or if it's a claim over 100,000, they must tell you within 60 days when it will be issued. If they say we need another 30 or 60 days and you're talking about a $5 million claim, uh, you probably should wait because it's somewhat complex. I had one time where the government said it'll be two years before we can get to this. You don't have to accept that. First of all, they knew something about the dispute long before this, and there's no way in the world that that's a reasonable time. So what you can do, if they don't issue a decision in a timely manner, or they don't issue it within a reasonable time that you're willing to live with, you can go to the board or to the court under what's known as a deemed denial and say the government's failure to respond to me, I deem to be a denial of my claim and I appeal that denial. And you have a right to go to the Board of Contract Appeals at any time on a deemed denial basis or within 90 days after receiving a contracting officer's decision. And those de that's a hard day. Day 91, you're out. So do it within 90 days. Uh, the other option that you have is to go to the Court of Federal Claims. Now, there's kind of a break here. We've seen where contractors have blown the deadline on the right of appeal to the board and we've been able to tell them, well, all hope is not yet lost. You can still go to the Court of Federal Claims within 12 months of having received the decision. The only thing you can't do is you can't do any judge shopping. Back in the early days, some contractors went to the Board of Contract Appeals and didn't like the judge, so they appealed the case instead to the Court of Federal Claims, hoping to get a better judge. And uh, the Court of Federal Claims looked at that and said, well, this is what amounts to judge shopping. You are stuck with the place you went first. So we're remanding it back to the Board of Contract Appeals. So uh, it's unfortunate that that becomes an issue in these cases. We have found that some judges are better than others. If only we could pick them in advance, but we can't. Some are more pro-contractor, some are more pro-government, and that's just the way that it is. Okay, um, the appeals process is, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have these filing deadlines. As I said, if you go to the board, you file a notice of appeal and then you file a complaint, which basically repeats the allegations that you made in your claim. If you go to the Court of Federal Claims, you don't file a notice of appeal, you just file a complaint. Again, it's pretty well going to track whatever your claim is. Um, there are some practical differences. Uh, the Board of Contract Appeals to get an administrative law judge. And those judges are appointed by the Secretary of the Army or in some cases, uh, one of the other uh, agencies. 
Uh, if it's a civilian agency, the judge may be appointed by uh, the Secretary of Health, Education, Welfare, or the Veterans Administration, whatever the case might be. But they're administrative law judges. Sometimes you got to be careful. Some of these judges are come directly from the agencies and they're very pro-agency. That doesn't mean you can't get a fair uh, result from them, but it might be a little harder. When you go to a board of contract appeals, though, your opponent is the agency's attorney, who's probably the same attorney who's been advising the contracting officer all along to deny your claim. So you may have someone who is not very flexible and, and, and willing to sell. Uh, however, in the Board of Contract Appeals, although it's a lot like a trial, it's a little less formal than going to court. And it may be that the case will be bifurcated, which means the judge may say, we're going to have a trial on entitlement. And if entitlement's found, then we'll remand it for negotiation of quantum or have a second trial on quantum. It makes a certain amount of sense because if the board finds that there's no entitlement, why do you want to have a quantum trial on how much money you're not entitled to? Uh, so it, it, it many times works out pretty well. In the Court of Federal Claims, you get really the equivalent of a federal district court judge uh, appointed by the President of the United States and approved by the Senate. And your opponent will be the Department of Justice. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. Depends on the luck of the draw. You may get a Justice Department of Attorney who takes a fresh look at the case and decides that it should be settled. Or you may get a Justice Department of Attorney who says, well, you know, the agency's my client. I'm going to do what they want me to do. I'm going to represent them to the best of my ability. And you end up in perhaps a longer process than you would have before the board. Uh, there's no rule of thumb that applies equally to all of these situations. Uh, you have to handle it on a case by case basis. But make no mistake about this process I'm talking about. If you get into litigation before a Board of Contract Appeals or the United States Court of Federal Claims, you're in a trial. You're going to have discovery and all that it involves, exchange of documents, review of documents, keyword issue tagging of documents. You're going to have depositions on both sides. You're going to have preparation of experts. You're going to have to put together your exhibits. You're going to have all kinds of trial preparation and interviewing witnesses. Then you're going to have a trial, which could take a week or two, depending on the size of the case. And then you're going to have post-trial briefing because the courts and the boards don't issue decisions on these complex construction cases from the bench. They want the parties to go through the briefs and point out to them in very lengthy briefing after the trial what it is that's important and why the court or the board should rule in their favor. And I must tell you, this is an expensive proposition. Uh, there's no, there's no, no, no fooling you about it. Depending on the size of the case, this part of the process can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you have to work carefully with your attorney on establishing a budget, make sure you know what you're getting into, and above all, you know, try to resolve the case earlier if you can. Uh, Post-trial proceedings, uh, Casey, why don't you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we'll try to keep it brief because I know we're out of time here, but like Michael said, he goes through a whole set of litigation and even the actual decision may not really re, you know, reflect the end of the process. So you might get a uh, decision on just entitlement, not quantum. That's common at the Board of Contract Appeals. They'll say that we agree the contractor encountered a different site condition. Go figure out what you think you're owed. And then you'll go back and negotiate. And if you can't come to an agreement, you might be back before that board trying the actual quantum or damages part of it. You might end up with a motion for reconsideration where one party's unhappy with what the judge has decided, either, again, partner and whole, and you might have to appeal and head to the, uh, the federal circuit and relitigate the issues again to some degree. So important to keep in mind that those post-trial options exist too. A contractor might win at the board or court of federal claims and still end up facing an appeal by the government. So there's no telling exactly when the process might end. Thanks, Casey. And, you know, one of the things that you should always consider, particularly before the Armed Services Board, because they really favor it, is ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, which means instead of going through a full trial, let's get a settlement judge to sit down in a very short one or two or three day proceeding 
hear both sides and see if that judge can't mediate a settlement. The government has to agree to it, but I recommend it wholly, highly because over 90% of the cases that have gone to ADR have been settled. It can be very persuasive when a judge says to the government, look, I know you understand your position, but the contractor makes a lot of sense here and you're probably going to lose. Uh, a different judge will hear the case than the ADR judge because that would be unfair. But it, it's a very good process. So always look into whether or not there can be an ADR. It's to your advantage. Okay, uh, I appreciate your attendance. Uh, as always, we're open to any questions. I don't think there are any posted yet, but as you think about it, if you uh, have questions for any of us, feel free to shoot us an email. We'll be happy to talk to you, to give you our thoughts, and we wish you the best in your continued dealings with our friends in the federal government. Thank you. <laughs>